Hello everyone, there's only two times when you really need to talk about dinosaurs. In the elementary school classroom and in the creationist classroom. Not really much difference really. Seriously, when do we ever talk about dinosaurs in our everyday lives? Never. Creationists who are trying to debunk evolution are probably dreaming about these creatures every night, plotting how they can use it to destroy evolution once and for all. So yeah, you can probably guess what the topic of this video is now. That's right, Flat Earth. Wait a minute, that was last week, F I am quite sure, for example, that there are many dinosaurs that ate meat. I'm quite sure that is the case. Yeah. But the proof that a particular dinosaur ate meat is supposed to be the fact that it has sharp teeth. And we all know that there are many animals today that have sharp teeth that do not eat meat. And besides which, we also know from God's word that no animal ate meat originally. They were all designed to eat plants originally. No animals ate meat originally? I mean, I guess that's kind of consistent with the actual origin of life. None of the organs organisms ate meat when they were just single-celled organisms. But of course, we disagree on when the origin was. So if you believe that no animal ate meat 6,000 years ago, then please tell me how did meat-eating animals come about? Did they just randomly appear? I mean, you don't believe in large-scale evolutionary changes, so this wouldn't have come about through evolution. So what is it then? Did God just magically create meat-eating abilities? Your worldview is quite strange. Now, in reality, it makes sense how evolution creates carnivores. You start off with plants and self-sufficient organisms that can photosynthesize or use another type of of energy production method, then they get high in numbers and it is beneficial for any organisms to consume them due to their abundance. So organisms will evolve to eat those plants with no competition for food source. Then of course their mobility gets more and more advanced and the number of herbivores grow, which promotes the evolution of carnivores again due to the abundance of the food source. But of course there's a cap eventually since the amount of energy transferred from one level to the next is very limited. Anyway, I hope you get the idea. This whole process requires creating new species of organisms. Therefore, it would be pretty amusing to watch creationists explain where meat eating came from. Since, you know, you can't just have an organism randomly change from being an herbivore to a carnivore. Where's my popcorn? So while we're quite happy to suggest that uh, like many animals today, they could have been dinosaurs that ate meat, this, these things cannot necessarily be found from simply examining the bones. You are literally only mentioning the sharpness of teeth. How silly. A tooth being sharp doesn't really necessarily tell us anything that's true, but if you closely examine it, you would indeed be able to tell the difference. Of course, we didn't just make this up out of nowhere. We obviously have a baseline to compare it to, and that's, you guessed it, animals that's currently existing today. For example, other than the teeth being sharp, it is also serrated. This allows the proper munching of flesh. The length is also longer in order to crush through the whole diameter of bones. Meanwhile, herbivores generally have large teeth for crushing purposes, but some do have a bit sharper teeth, but they are still in no comparison to the one of carnivores. Oh, by the way, sometimes the last meal of a dinosaur would actually be fossilized inside its stomach. <laughs> well, that's good evidence right there. No need to go any further. That being said, it's not always easy. Sometimes fossils are misidentified, sometimes the teeth are missing, and sometimes its teeth is missing consistently, suggesting the dinosaur had no teeth to begin with. It's not an easy process. There's a lot of sweat and tears that goes into discovering these things. Meanwhile, creationists just come along and claim they know just because they know. Very different procedural processes, and if I had to pick one side to believe, it's probably the side that put a hundred times more work into their knowledge. There is no magic formula. When you look at bones, you can't crack a bone open and find a message inside saying, this ate meat, uh, any more than you can find a message inside saying, this was 65 million years old. You know, the, right. the messages are not there printed in the bones. Even if somehow there was a message inside the bones of dinosaurs that told us some of them ate meat, you wouldn't accept that anyway. But like I said before, science is a gruesome process. It's definitely not easy, and it takes the collaborations of thousands of scientists to even find out small bits of information. Just finding fossils itself is incredibly difficult, and they come rarely as a whole. You'll be stuck on a roadblock just piecing everything together. Anyway, regarding the 65 million year old comment that's also figured out using science. Yay to our various dating methods. Geometric dating using rock layers is pretty cool and is one of our first methods. I'll give it a 9 out of 10. Radiometric dating, very creative, very accurate. Also has the advantage of cross-checking itself. Absolutely perfect, 10 out of 10. Carbon dating, very good, very accurate, and can be calibrated with tree rings, but cannot date things that are too old, 8 out of 10. Tinder dating, 0 out of 10. In fact, the messages that we often find, and of course these have to be interpreted as well, but you crack the bones open and instead of finding that tag telling us what it did, you find soft tissue. Still pliable blood vessels. Oh yes, and that's a huge one, isn't it? Doesn't that really question the entire uh, idea that these dinosaurs went extinct 66 million years ago if we can still find pliable tissue? And yet, what is their excuse? Well, they say, 
this can only mean two things. Either what we've been telling people about the age of dinosaurs 66 plus million years ago has been wrong all of these years, our soft tissue must be able to survive for 66 million years. And that, look at his smug face as he's spewing nonsense to his audience. This soft tissue argument has been used so many times, I'm honestly tired of hearing it. The thing I always say is that although flat earthers are stupid, they at least come up with new arguments every so often. Creationists, on the other hand, literally only know how to repeat the same things over and over again. Claims that have been debunked years ago. The answer to this question resides in iron. It is similar to formaldehyde in the fact that it can preserve animal tissue. Usually cells degrade pretty rapidly due to the microbes that feast on them, but the presence of iron can actually create a state more favorable for the preservation of tissue. You can even do an experiment yourself, just put some animal collagen into an iron solution and see how long it lasts. Well actually this has been done already and the experimental group lasts years more than the control group. And of course, iron is quite in abundance inside the cells of animals, because you can find an iron molecule in each of the units of hemoglobin, which are found on red blood cells. That's why your blood tastes like metal. I'm not saying this will always happen, but if the conditions are just right, you can get enough iron to preserve dinosaur collagen for a long, long time. The truth of the matter is, preservation varies greatly. Some hardly last at all, some last forever. So if you have the right conditions, you most certainly can preserve tissue for millions of years. Now, if you really think dinosaurs are young, please explain the 99% of fossils we find of them that don't don't have soft tissue. So stupid how you would just grasp this one scenario and think it proves your entire point. You know what would prove your point? If all the dinosaur fossils we found had soft tissue, or at least the majority of them. But if it's just this one, that's absolutely not a piece of evidence of their young age. Don't ever bring the shit up to me again. And of course, it's the latter that they're searching for. They're trying to find a sort of what I call a pickling mechanism, uh, something that must have preserved it, like uh, Swedish pickled herrings or something that preserved them over a long period of time. That's exactly what it is, except it's iron. Look at you, just dismissing it without even knowing what it is exactly. It's been shown in experimentation that tissue can last significantly longer in the presence of iron. At the very least, you should know what the counterargument is. You don't even try to hear what the scientists have to say. But yeah, it's, it's a good example of where they, they will actually quietly sort of push that on one side, really, because it's a bit inconvenient to talk about, and yet other things they're quite happy to make comments on. I mean, there's literally nothing else to discuss. You're trying to give attention to something so small. It's like picking out one straw of a hay sack and saying, hey, look, evidence against evolution, when the other millions of hay strands are staring you right in the face. There are plenty of other things to discuss. Thank you very much. Let's look at a few other examples of how these ideas are sort of twisted and it appears very appealing to believe this. There's a fascinating exhibit in London's Natural History Museum uh, where you see um, a dinosaur called a Tenontosaurus and the display shows it being attacked by four smaller dinosaurs uh, called Deinonychus. Yes. And the caption that goes with it says, uh, did Dinonychus hunt in packs. Did it hunt in packs? Well, we don't know. Right. But their evidence for this is that there was one place where they found five fossils together, one Tenontosaurus and four Dinonychuses. <laughs> so they claim that from that, that's evidence that they hunted in packs. So the Dinonychuses hunted the Tenontosaurus, found it and killed it. And then presumably all suddenly immediately fell over backwards and dropped dead and got fossilized. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks for sharing that with the audience so they know what isn't true. Here's the story. Basically, whenever scientists dug up a Tenontosaurus, there was a good chance that a Deinonychus fossil was nearby. Essentially, that tells us that they at least shared the same environment. The Deinonychus is a carnivore, suggesting that they perhaps hunted the Tenontosaurus on a regular basis. The reason we may think that the Deinonychus hunted in groups was not necessarily because they were found in groups near a potential prey, but rather they weren't as large as their prey, so assuming they did hunt the Tenontosaurus on a regular basis, then it's a reasonable assumption that they hunted in large numbers. Of course, there's no real evidence for this is just a path of logical thinking, but if you think this was sold off as fact, that certainly is not the case. In fact, this has been challenged by many other scientists, especially on the assumption that the Deinonychus hunted the Tenontosaurus. So no, scientists do not agree on this, and the piece of information has not been passed off as more than just an assumption. Because you see, you can't have it both ways. No. They claim that fossils don't form fast, and yet there, the only way their story makes sense is if they were fossilized fast. 
That's actually a complete misrepresentation of the situation. Fossils form slowly over millions of years. But to have the situation here be true about hunting in groups, they just have to die together at the right time. That's it. They can be in close proximity and still fossilize together over millions of years. That's not contradictory. Now, I'm not defending the assumption that the Denonicus hunted in coordinated groups, but your way of attacking the claim is just outright wrong. You could have mentioned any of the points I said earlier and it would have been fine, but instead you chose something that doesn't even make sense. Tsk tsk, I'm incredibly disappointed. You know, and this is not an isolated example. This is not in the same museum. They have a, a dinosaur called a centrosaurus, and they claim, the reason why it's called centrosaurus, which means circular lizard, is because they say the herds of them were in a circle because there was one place where they found a number of fossils in a circle. So that herd obviously dropped dead altogether and got fossilized immediately. These are stories, you see, because it's got nothing to do with reality. Right. That's actually wrong. The Centrosaurus got its name because of the way its horns are placed on its head. And again, them being found in groups does not mean the fossilization process has to be rapid. It just means they die together, and indeed, that's what we see in the locations where we found them. Alright, I'm going to repeat this one last time. All it says is that they die together, rapidly, one after another, or at the same time. It doesn't say anything about the fossilization rate, which is still over millions of years. Nothing's changed about that. So we can't determine the actual, the truth from looking at fossils. We can't no. go back in the past and see how they lived their lives. We see the, the clues. We even see ichnofossils. We find their footprints. We find sometimes digested stomach contents. I love how you just said digested stomach contents when earlier in the video you literally just talked about not being able to know exactly what they ate. This is a champion of a video you got here. So yeah, there are plenty of things we can discover just from the leftover evidence. Sure, we can't know everything. We can't even know most things about these dinosaurs' lives. But we can know some, such as when they lived. So there's a number of things that can be inferred. Correct. But it's all inference. It's all interpretation. Just because it's interpretation doesn't mean it's wrong, because many times there's only one good interpretation, such as the f***ing age of the dinosaur bones. It is, and yet there's some of the evidence that we have where you can actually say something about the behaviors are precisely the ones that they want to uh, omit. For example, the idea of dinosaur footprints fossilized, where the dinosaurs were clearly on tiptoe, looking like they were running while actually partially submerged in water. Ah, uh, stop it. Uh, my brain hurts. Uh, <laughs> It's too good. They're just grasping at anything they can. It's just, they're too desperate. It's adorable, these motherfuckers. Well, you know, what's interesting is oftentimes we see these dinosaur footprints, and I've had the privilege of hand casting some of mm. these um, Acrocanthosaurus prints yes. and other dinosaurs. We find their, their footprints, and in the layers just above, many times we find the fossils of the dinosaurs themselves. But these are supposedly separated by millions of years. So yes. what happened? Did they leave their prints? And then for millions of years, all of a sudden, then they get buried in the fossil record? Yeah, that's right. You better provide a source for that claim right now and prove to me that the dinosaur that created the print is the same as the bones you found a couple layers above. If you can't do that, then I'm going to have to fossilize you. Whoa, okay, I'm getting a little too feisty here, so I'm going to end the video now.